be seated. There's a place in the hearts of God's people for a kind of holy imagining. Begin to learn what God is like and you imagine what that means in your circumstance. But there's also a place in your hearts and lives for a, a welcoming in the moment where you say, in this place, in this day, for this time, I'm going to worship. I am going to be his person in this place today. Heavenly Father, God, we come in this moment today before you. Thank you. Thank you that there is an invitation, an encouragement to, to check our hearts, uh, a welcome to come and to receive what we need for today and to be prepared for the days to come. I know people come from lots of different places and there, some weeks have been very discouraging. Others times filled with questions and very few answers. For some, this past week has been a, a time in which they have been aware of what you have for them and enjoying the, the challenges of the life you've entrusted to us. Father, whether it's been a difficult week or an encouraging week, Lord, we come to you now and we say that in this moment, in this service, in, in this time, we want to embrace what you have for us. We want to receive that work of yours that has come through your Son, Jesus Christ. We want to remember well his death. We want to receive from you the encouragement and the calling that comes because Christ has loved us so well. And today we want to recognize that it's not just about us. It's about the days in which you've given us and the world in which we live. And we want to be good stewards of every one of those opportunities to pray for those in authority over us, to be aware of those serving our country around the world, those places in which our fellow uh, believers are suffering incredible persecution. Lord, the, the work of yours spans the globe and we honor you and thank you for the privilege of being part of that body in which you have called to serve you in these days and this morning we want to honor you with our tithes and our offerings and what we want these to represent who we are a piece of what you've entrusted to us that we return to you saying that we recognize the privilege of being a steward of yours in every area of life so father Thank you for the opportunity to give. We ask your blessing on each gift and each giver. In your name, amen. Hmm. So I don't know how often it happens to you that you get a call um, that a friend of yours is in the area. Maybe somebody you haven't seen for long and uh, they are on their way through and wanted to stop by, catch up, visit for just a moment and all of a sudden you look around the living room. You've been sitting there and contentedly, you know, reading or whatever. Um, and all of a sudden the room looks different to you. Oh no, that, look, I have left, you know, like five coffee cups over there on that end table. And, and uh, you begin to see, wait, probably I ought to pick up those the shirts that I'd been folding been sitting there for the last couple of days and well it just looks different right and you just get busy and you realize oh I'd, I'd like to kind of clean up a little bit and depending on how much time you have you either do a quick little straighten up you know where you hide all the dirty dishes in the oven no I know none of you do that right that wouldn't happen in any of your homes <laughs> or you actually do some vacuuming and dusting and cleaning and getting ready for someone that's going to come. When the Apostle Paul writes to 
the believers. They're in the church in Corinth. He's dealing with a group of people that are struggling. Okay, Things have not been going particularly well for them within their church family. There has been some very significant disagreements between the believers there. They have been treating each other poorly in different circumstances. And when he writes them, he gives them a set of instructions that include how things ought to look different than they are going on. One area that ought to look different is how it looked when they come together around what he calls the Lord's Supper. All right? The Lord's Supper, we sometimes call it the celebration of communion. It's a, a meal that they shared together that had a particular function within their body. It was supposed to regularly remind them of things that ought to be different because Jesus is coming. He writes to them in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he takes the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever... You eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. There was this sense of expectancy that was supposed to develop in them an appreciation for Christ's activity in the moment. It was supposed to change the way they acted. Without that, without that responsiveness to what Christ wants, without a sense of awareness, a responsiveness to his voice, an integration of the lesson, Paul tells them that if you, if you don't respond, if you don't get this right, if you really are not remembering well, then when you come together, it's really not even the Lord's Supper that you're eating. For them, they were taking the Lord's Supper, they were going through the motions, but they weren't connecting with the work of Christ for them. This morning we're going to give you an opportunity to kind of follow in those steps in kind of a symbolic way, to take the Lord's Supper together with us. But let me tell you that unless you remember well, it's not really the Lord's Supper that you eat. Remember what you're celebrating for. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The soon coming of Christ gives us really the, the motivation to remember well. I want you first of all to remember the awfulness of sin. You might remember that when Jesus set this particular meal in motion, he and his disciples were gathered there for really their last night together around the Jewish Passover. Remember that? It's the Passover celebration that uh, Jesus gives these instructions. It's during that meal that he reminds them and gives them these elements within the meal, common, ordinary things, the glass of wine, the bread. It was part of every meal. You remember what the Passover was about? The Passover was that last act of God that freed the children of Israel from slavery in Egypt and brought them out of the land. Moses had been coming to Pharaoh over and over again and telling him that the, God says it's time to let Israel go. Let my people go. You, know, you remember those words perhaps. And finally they come to this last moment, Pharaoh's last chance and his last betrayal and Moses is told that there is coming an awful judgment on Egypt and the children of Israel the obedient ones that, that hear and respond to God's word are supposed to make a very special sacrifice they're to take a lamb and they're to slaughter it and they're to catch the blood in the basin and 
They're to take a, a branch and they're to paint the blood on the doorposts of their homes. And the promise God makes to the children of Israel in that moment is that this blood that's there at the entrance to their homes would be a sign for them on the houses. Oh, hey Stephen, you want to get me back? There you go. He says that this blood would be a sign for you wherever you are. He says, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Jesus and the disciples are gathered there. They're celebrating the Passover, the shedding of innocent blood. That moment, that sacrifice, sets the pattern for a lifestyle of sacrifice that God begins to design for the people of Israel. Where they come together and as part of their worship, innocent blood is shed. Remember that all through the days when the tabernacle in the wilderness, finally when the temple is built there in Jerusalem, there is the shedding of blood. Hebrews says, in fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Remember, as we celebrate together the awful penalty of sin. From the very beginning of God's work with mankind, from the Garden of Eden to today, the truth has been that the wages of sin is death. The reality is that sin always brings death. We all know what a wage is, right? It's what you earn when you work for something. Well, what you earn from sin, that's part of every one of our experiences, is this sense of God's judgment, this, this, this overbearing reality of death that comes to us and wants to rip life right out of us. Back in the garden, the promise was made to Adam and Eve that when you eat of it, you will surely die. And that work of sin in our hearts and lives has been real ever since then. Every one of us has turned to our own way. We've neglected what we knew we should do. We have done what we knew we shouldn't do. We rebelled against the God who wanted the very best for us. And when we turn away, that has very real consequences on the life that God intended for us. First, it creates an eternal gulf between a holy God and a sinful people. It, it is that gulf that we first must address when we think about the awfulness of, of sin. It creates an eternal separation that we can do nothing to bridge on our own. For unbelievers, this is why we see that all end up without hope and without life from God. But really, even in the hearts and lives of believers, sin carries its own sense of penalty. In our hearts and lives, there is this ongoing struggle with sin. It's a reality that we know. And surely each one of you have experienced it. Those times in which you've lived in rebellion to God, where you said no to Him, that where you preferred your own way when you knew what God's way, where God's way led. For unbelievers, there comes a day where they are offered the opportunity to repent and place their faith and trust in God, to receive Him as their Savior, to entrust their lives to Him. For believers, there's those moments as we journey where First John says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And those words were written to the church, the people that need to restore their fellowship with God, even though the relationship is there. To walk with God 
means to be aware of the awfulness of sin and to turn away, to repent. Perhaps the awfulness of sin is most seen in the payment that's demanded for it. Because sin always requires a personal sacrifice. Whether it was the animals that came from your flock or finally the Savior that came from heaven for us. Peter writes that, you know, it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. We see in Christ all of those patterns from the Old Testament, all the the sacrifices from the time of Moses until the time of Christ, a picture, a preparation, uh, an expression of what God had intended from the foundations of the earth that Christ would become, right? Our Passover lamb. So the awfulness of sin is seen in the demand for Jesus to come. For God to send his only son. In 1 Corinthians 11, in those passages we began with, Paul writes about the seriousness of partaking. He talks about it being possible to take the communion in an unworthy manner. In a way that is kind of without recognizing or discerning. Right? He says, For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. Important. When we come together to recognize the impact of Christ's sacrifice for us personally. To recognize the awfulness of our own sin and our orientation to Christ's sacrifice and his saving work. For Christ is the only sacrifice for sin. Not not just since the cross, but really even before the cross, it was Christ's sacrifice. Those before the cross, in faith, receive the benefits of what Christ has done since the cross. For you and I, remember, this is to be a time where we remember the awfulness of sin. It always brings death, and it required Christ's personal sacrifice for us. Remember it. We're to remember until he comes. There's going to come a day where we don't just celebrate the Savior. We don't just remember his saving work. We see it when we see him. Remember the awfulness of sin until he comes. Secondly, to celebrate well, we have to rejoice in the awesome love of God demonstrated in this moment. It tells us that God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You look back at that moment on the cross, and in that moment for you and I, all of our sins were still in the future. Right? But God knew what we needed, and he provided for us forgiveness because he loved us. And in that moment, above any other moment in history, we see God's heart. Christ's sacrifice proves it to us. That's, that's what's going on in the celebration of communion. It tells us that God loved us so much that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. That's the connection. God loved us. He gave his son. Loving and giving go together in God's heart. There's a a verse that comes in another passage in Romans chapter 8 that looks at God's love for us in this incredible picture. It talks about if God is for us, who can be against us? It says, he who did not spare his own son They gave him up for us all. How will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? We celebrate God's heart, his intent, his good plans 
for us in this moment. God's love makes a difference in almost every part of life. Love motivated God to do what only he could do. Love is demonstrated in his word for us in every way. It changes how we receive what God has to say for us. When you think of God's law, does that tug on your heartstrings? When you think of God's commands, his teachings, they seem cold and distant until you put it in the context of a God who loves you. A God who knows you, who wants the best for you until you trust God's heart. And when you do that, when you make the connection between God's love for you and his word, all of a sudden those things would seem harsh and cold. Take on a new meaning. Let's listen to Psalm 19. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them your servant is warned in keeping them. There is great reward. Do you see love infused all through those things which would often be cold? often be distant, often we would push away from those things. But because they come from a God of love, they're refreshing, they bring joy, they give light, they're sweet, sweeter than honey. Hmm. Christ's sacrifice shows God's heart and it forms a pattern for our lives. When we come to the communion table, we not only receive from God, but we're instructed by it. It becomes for us Christ's example to follow. Christ is the model for us. He, he modeled obedience, right? He, he came to do his Father's will. Right? And the scripture tells us that we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Because if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. Another place it says, we love because he first loved us. Christ's pattern, right? Make the relationship right between well, you and I and our Heavenly Father. Relationships are really important to God. And it's not just about those a vertical relationship with God. It's about our relationships with one another. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is challenging those people who are listening to him at the beginning of his ministry. The importance of relationship comes through really clearly when Jesus tells them that if you're offering your gift at the altar and they remember that your brother or sister has something against you, just leave your gift there. First go and be reconciled to them and come and offer your gift. So this morning, as we partake of this time of remembrance, as we celebrate the Lord's Supper together, there's really two really important relationships that I want you to think about. First is your relationship to God. Right? Have you come to that place, that initial step where you come and commit your heart to Him? Where you say, Father God, I want to be yours secondly have you looked around you and are those relationships within your life are they oriented right hmm. when we rejoice in the awesome love of God it shapes every other relationship within our life hmm. until he comes see there's going to come a day where in the light of his love, those kind of relationships are going to be changed. The opportunity to choose to offer to him our hearts in that way, well, that opportunity is going to be gone to kind of respond by faith to his invitations, to work through those relationships. Today is the day. Today is the day.
to not only remember the awfulness of sin, but to rejoice in the awesome love of God. And finally, today's the day to respond to the amazing leading of God until he comes. Hmm. Jesus looked ahead in his own ministry and he said, the reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. Jesus was going God's way. He said, I'm laying it down before my Father. I'm laying down my life, and that's the invitation for each one of us. When we come to the table, we receive Christ's life, but we lay ours 